My crazy ex-boyfriend got obsessed with me. Part 2. Do we ever really know the people that we are sitting next to? The people with laugh, with love and trust? You might be surprised to know that they're hiding. Seeing Uncle Dave in the hospital did not evoke any feelings in me. I did not feel pity or relief that someone had finally gotten the better of him. All I could note when I saw him was that he was human, just like me. Even though he seemed to believe that he was immortal, it seemed that he was not. That night, I talked to Paul about what had happened. I guess it was such a shock to me that I wanted to dissect every detail. What do you think could have done it? Maybe he was mugged? I asked. Maybe, or he messed with the wrong people. From what I could tell when I saw him the last time, he did not seem very likable. Let us stop talking about this. You were the one who was always telling me to stop obsessing over cases when I'm home. He smirked, coming closer to me and making all the thoughts that were clouding my mind disappear. He was obsessed with mysteries, he even had his little room filled with investigations into cases that I was not allowed to get into. He was also very good at his job. His colleagues all spoke highly of him. Fine, I just can't help thinking how easy it was for him to get attacked. I guess I'm scared, I sighed. You do not have to be scared, I'm right here, he kissed me on the forehead. It was at times like this when he could calm my racing thoughts that I believed we were meant to be. I always felt safe and wanted by him. Yes, we are not perfect, but even our fighting made me love him more. As serious as he was, I could bring out the more childish and gleeful side of him, which I did when I tackled him, leading him to being beneath me, and started planting kisses on him while he laughed, taken by surprise. Our passion was still alive and well, even after a year. Naturally, our bodies connected, and we made love right after that. We fell asleep in each other's arms. The next morning, I discussed what had happened with Javier, and he did not pity my uncle. He was glad that someone had put him in his place. But Javier, he's still a person, I protested. After what he did to you at your cousin's wedding, he's always led a dangerous life. It was most likely the people that he wronged. I know, I just... He might die, I shrugged. Look, I'm not saying I'm happy he got beat up. I just believe that it was coming for him. Anyways... Look who's on his way, your manager. He pointed at the woman who was heading towards us. She was the last person I wanted to see. Both of you, why are you not working? And Orlando, why the hell does that last report look like that? I could not even make sense of it, she complained. Ma'am, you know that Haley was the one who did the figures. She would not allow me to revisit it before it was sent, I protested. Ridiculous, Haley does not make mistakes like that. You know what? I'm taking you off the team. You can do something less challenging, she almost smirked. She knew that project was my way to getting a promotion. I sighed. It sucked being treated like this, but I had to be professional. Should not take her nonsense. She's always had a chip on her shoulder. Maybe if you say something to our boss, Javier had a look of pity in his eyes. It's okay, Javier. It's just a bad week for me. Another opportunity will present itself, I reassured him. It seemed that no matter how hard I worked or how much I tried, I was falling short lately. What I did not expect was to get an email later that week from my boss saying that I was going to lead the team for that particular project. Miss Winston, my manager, was not going to come to work for a few days. I was surprised since she had kicked me off, and I did not even tell Paul on the day she kicked me off the project. I was feeling much better about writing down the events of the past few days in my journal. Whenever I was going through things that I could not explain or process, I would write them down and I would feel so much better after expressing myself. I did, however, tell him about me being promoted to leading the team for the time being, and he was so happy for me. He even took me out for dinner, even though I insisted that he did not have to do that for me. But he was always trying to make me happy. He was just so sweet. I'm happy for you, even though it may seem small to you. Your happiness is my happiness, he said. What did I do to deserve you? I smiled. I will always love you and protect you. He touched my hand. I was feeling so happy as he always made me. It is you and me against the world, I declared. Before him, I had only seen a glimmer, a slight possibility of what love was, but being with him proved to me that true love existed. When I got back to work the next day, I was met with shocking news. Miss Winston had been involved in an accident. The gas in her house had burst and burnt down the whole house. She was okay, but had been hurt and suffered from smoke inhalation. It was eerie how the last time that I spoke to her, we had not been very nice to each other. Everyone huddled in the office, sharing theories about what had happened, and I could not help feeling as if this was strange. Two people in my life had just gotten attacked in the space of a few days. 
When I saw Paul, I held him tightly. I'd been so scared all day because of what had happened. Over the next couple of weeks, it was as if Doomday had befallen our town. What had begun as incidents unseemly unrelated to each other was now a series of crimes and accidents. No one ever died, but many came close to the brink of death. The priest at my church, he drank something containing a chemical he was allergic to. One of the burly guys I went to school with who I will never forget because of how he prayed on the weak, especially people who were different, nearly drowned after his car swerved off a bridge. Paul told me that the police were suspecting that someone was behind the accident, as most of them were too random to say that it was a coincidence. They were trying to find out what those people had in common, and I was wondering as well. Even one of my ex-boyfriends ended up being a victim. We did not get along that well. When we dated, he cheated on me. I got over it by writing how I felt for days until I had nothing left to say. Many people were now scared for their lives, as rumors were flying about who this person who was messing with people's breaks or even switching people's medication around was. Those who had contact with this person said that they could not tell how they looked, but they would see a man with dark clothes loitering around them before the accident. But with all the stories, both true and false, it was difficult for police to gather what the truth was. So we lived in fear and anticipation of who was going to be the next victim. It was no longer safe to go out at night, as if it seemed like crime was lurking. Paul told me that many criminals were now using this as an opportunity to be bold and start committing petty crimes, like theft which would have been blamed on the man wearing black. Javier did not seem scared at all of the man in black. He seemed to think that this guy was targeting people who had done something wrong. He gave me a few examples of the priest. There were once allegations that he was abusing young girls, but there was no proof. And Mrs. Winston, who had questionable worth ethics. But it did not make sense, as some of the people seemed decent. There was nothing linking them to each other, or so I thought. I told Javier that stuff like that only happened in Riverdale, not here in our town. But he seemed to know quite a lot about it. On the other hand, Paul was worried about me, as he felt that every person was in danger from the man attacking people. He would call me nearly every hour to check up on me and would get paranoid when I went too long without contacting him. And while I was worried about what was happening, I thought that he was taking it a bit too far. We argued one night when I found out that he had installed a tracking app on my phone. I was using his phone, mine's battery had died, and I wanted to send an email. I came across an email linking me to a website for tracking people, along with a summary of my daily activities. I was very upset over that. I went over to his investigation room, pounded on the door, and waited for him to come out. What is this? Are you mad? I shouted. I just wanted to make sure that you were okay. I do not want you to end up being attacked, he protested. You're being ridiculous now. You do not want me to attend my family gatherings or to visit anyone. I think you're getting obsessed with the case, he said. I'm doing this all for you so we can be together. Do you not understand? He looked at me, with almost a crazed and desperate look on his face. I cannot do this right now. I'm going to Javier's, I said. So that he can tell you that I'm being obsessive? Yes, you wanted to move out of town with me a few months ago. But when your friend said you had not known me for a long time, suddenly you changed your tune, he said softly, seeming to have let go of the anger, but looking sadder. We are fine here. Do not make this about him. I do not get why you two not get along. Right now, I cannot be with you. I'm too upset. A freaking tracking app? I scoffed, took my wallet, and slammed the door behind me. I spent the night on Javier's sofa. He comforted me and told me that my boyfriend was childish and he did not deserve me. It's not that. He cares about me, I started. He's always wanting to know where you are and who you're with. It started to get worse due to the attacks. He loves me. What do you know about love? I asked. He looked down. Oh no, I had crossed the line. I loved you, he said. I'm sorry, shouldn't have said that. I was feeling ashamed. I understand. She get some rest. Come here, he said, bringing me in for an embrace. I felt so much better. He always had a way of making me feel like that. I wonder what I would do without him. If only he and Paul would somehow manage to get along with each other. They both just wanted the best for me. But they needed to understand that I was an adult. I could take care of myself. I was not as fragile as they thought. I went to sleep early that night, ignoring the multiple messages Paul sent me. The next morning, my world imploded as I left, wondering what the hell had happened. There was a loud knock on the door, frantic with shouting. I quickly ran and opened it, wondering what the emergency was. Javier? A cop asked. No, I said. They pushed past me without another word, and then they started searching the house. A few minutes later, Javier was brought out in cuffs, struggling. What's going on? Release him, I shouted, trying to get closer to him. 
Do not intervene with the law, my boy. You are lucky we got here in time, a man said behind me. I turned around and saw a man I recognized, Paul's colleague. What do you mean? I asked. Javier is the man behind the attacks. We are still investigating, but we linked him to 10 attacks over the past few months, he said. No, that's impossible. Javier is a good person. There has to be a mistake, I protested. I was beginning to feel hysterical now. Everything was happening in the wrong way, almost as if I was living in a distorted reality. I think you will believe Paul. Javier attacked him last night, he said. I looked at Javier when he said it, and he kept on mumbling that it was a mistake. He did not do anything wrong. Battling for my attention were Paul, who had been attacked, and Javier, the person accused of attacking him. He kept on shouting that he did not do it. He cared about me and he would never put me in danger. I did not know. When they took him away, the man I had spoken to told me that which hospital I could find Paul in. I rushed to get there as soon as I could. I was sure that once I got there, he would tell me it was all a mistake and that my best friend was not some serial attacker who had nearly murdered 10 people. When I got there, he had plaster on his hand and a bruise under his cheek. I regretted leaving him the previous night and broke out into uncontrollable sobs. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I kept on mumbling. He opened his eyes slowly and smiled when he looked at me. You're alive. I caught him, last night. They searched his things at the office and they found all the things he used to commit the crimes. And he could not say much because I had now enfolded him in a hug. He did this to you, I asked? Yes, I'm sorry you had to find out like this. It does not make any sense, I said. Last night at around midnight, he came to my place wearing a black clothes. He attacked me. And when he was running away, he dropped a ring with a red stone, he said. Javier's ring that he never took off. Oh gosh, I felt so weak when I realized what my friend had been doing. I managed to call a colleague, they pieced it all together when I told him it was his, and then I passed out from the beating. If not for the ring, I would never have found out. You know why he's doing this? I asked. He's always been extreme about his views, maybe just hating them was enough. Javier believes in the queer people's rights, not hate, and he said the killings had to be linked. Of course he would say that, to throw you off the trail. Come to think of it, he thought Uncle Davy deserved to be attacked, and he had been there when Mrs. Winston demoted me from the project. I told Paul this, and he gasped. Maybe he was obsessed with you. That was a part of why he did all this, he said. I could not find it in my heart to believe anything that had happened in the past 24 hours. I'm sorry for not listening to you. He was right next to me, and I had no idea, I sighed. I told you, I'll always protect you and make sure that you're okay. But you think I'm controlling you, he said. I do not think that, I protested. Then let us leave this place and start over, he suggested. Your job, I started. I can get another one, and you can have another opportunity anywhere. Do you not want to spend the rest of your life with me? I do. Okay, let us move away. There is nothing left for me here except you. I kissed him on the cheek. His eyes lit up and I felt warm, but I could not help feeling as if there was something I was missing. The news of Javier's arrest rocked the town, and everyone was relieved. It was difficult, however, to hear someone call Javier a monster. Was he truly one? A week afterwards, Paul was discharged, and we started to make arrangements to get out of town. He kept on insisting that he would clean out his investigation room on his own, but I was worried about him, straining himself. So one night after work, while he was taking a nap, I decided to help him by cleaning out the room, as we were leaving the following week after I served my notice. I stole the key from his pocket and went to open the room. He was always taking care of me. Now I would take care of him. I walked into a shrine dedicated to me. There were pictures of me from a young age until now, and the victims of the attacks. Their pictures surrounding me. And there, on the desk, was my journal, and the ones that I had been keeping for the past few years. Who had I fallen in love with? To be continued. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to become part of our Rainbow Force and stay wholesome.